Hello and welcome to World of Oil Derivatives. I'm Greg Newman, the CEO of Onyx Capital Group. Today we're looking at the role of carbon and the impact moves towards reduction and avoidance is likely to have on the commodities world in the near future. Joining me to discuss this is Eric Rubenstein, managing partner of New Climate Ventures. Eric has been a commodity trader, strategist and investor in various capacities for over 15 years and in recent years has brought his focus to sustainability and the circular economy by way of investing in early stage companies with a focus on carbon reduction and avoidance. A quick reminder before we get started, this podcast is available on YouTube if you prefer to watch. So welcome to the podcast, Eric. Thanks very much for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Greg. So just diving straight in from a, from a trader's perspective, how can we define the carbon market as it is right now? Absolutely. It's a, a very young market. So when you're looking at commodities markets, typically they, they do age over time and, and you have to start somewhere. So when a new market emerges, which the, the carbon market isn't a new market per se, but the way that it's evolved is, is rather novel and new. So there's a regulated market, and those are the ones that most traders are familiar with already. Uh, so regulated markets in, say, California, in Europe, uh, there are uh, tax regimes in uh, Canada and other places. But the voluntary market is the majority of the market today, and, and I think that's going to grow over time. So when you think about the carbon market from a trading perspective, it's generally a buyer's market where people are looking to purchase offsets because you're offsetting emissions of some sort, right? An airline, uh, it's hard to decarbonize the airline industry. An airline will buy carbon offsets uh, while they're transitioning, while they're waiting for those next planes to arrive that are less carbon intensive than the planes that are already there, whether they're run on electric or hydrogen, which will take you know, 10 to 30 years to, to play out or if they're run on jet fuel, but just more efficient planes. So the, the corporates are purchasing offsets. Um, so it isn't, isn't a market that's being traded aggressively, but it is something where there are companies that are, are trading offsets as well. Um, there are oil companies, for instance, that, that buy and sell offsets, uh, depending on, on need and to help create a marketplace that is more robust. So you need market makers in that space um, but the reality is we, the, the world, corporations in the world are setting aggressive goals for carbon reduction and the supply of offsets has been drawing down faster than, than the offsets have been created. And we can get into that in a few minutes, I think, with, uh, with future questions. But the natural sell side flow is owners of the offset, excess, excess offsets that they can go and throw into the market on the sell side. Is that fair to say? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's developers. So uh, you can think of developers in the world we're in today, at least, as folks that are, are putting together projects that are protecting forests or planting trees. Uh, there are other types of offsets. And I think the type, the sectors that are going to be reflected in the types of offsets is going to grow over time. Um, and I'd love to talk about that in a few minutes. But, but right now, it's these project developers who are... Uh, protecting a forest, let's say, and by protecting that forest, they produce an offset. There's bodies called registries that uh, you can go through in order to uh, put a stamp of approval on the process mm -hmm. and on the methodology associated with protecting that forest, let's say. And then that, that effectively creates the offset. Um, so people are going through that process, making that available to the corporate buyers, and people are then buying those offsets. So that would be an oil, we, you know, that's a classic producer and then the end user, and that's the kind of natural two-way flow. But already this is quite a heavily speculated market on, from my understanding. I don't actually have the data on it from the sounds of it. Uh, a lot of people say carbon prices need to be a lot higher. And I always wonder, what does that actually mean? And there's a hell of a lot of speculation seemed, seems to be in that market that, you know, if you already, like you just started the conversation saying it's drawing down the availability of it, and then you add speculators that who are taking some of that sell side volume. It's already quite frothy and quite volatile. I, yeah, it's that's not really a question. I guess that's more of a statement. But I guess the, the leading question is, how do you perceive the robustness of the carbon market as it is now, or the voluntary carbon market as it is now? It's not as robust as it will be, I guess, is, mm. is the way it's <laughs> developing, right? It, mm. uh, it, being that a lot of this development has really happened over the last two years, let's say, um, 
it's it's still very young. So, I mean, I guess you can liken it to, I, I like to think of it similar to IMO 2020 or something of that sort. And yeah. so people in the oil markets, if they're familiar with, with uh, when you have spec changes, you're creating an entirely new product, basically. That, and, and that in and of itself creates a new market. That was due to regulation where you had to reduce sulfur for bunker fuel. Um, but what it did was it created a couple of years prior to the, uh, I guess, the rule going into effect where there was a lot of volatility, right? As, as people were trying to position for what that future looks like. And that's kind of where we are now, where there are these different um, needs where corporations are setting goals and they have to buy certain amounts of offsets because they've set goals and they've made those public. And if they're a public company, they're they're now being pressured by investors and by other stakeholders to to meet whatever goals that they're setting. Uh, but on the other side, uh, it's everything is still evolving and there are there's question as to what regulation is going to be in the future. Um, there's uncertainty as to when these needs are going to be. So something like Corsia, which is uh, basically uh, a regulation for, for airlines to, to be offsetting or to have reduced their emissions by uh, certain amounts in a certain period of time. And that, that window keeps getting rolled back slowly. So Mm -hmm. what could happen? And this was a concern with IMO 2020 as well, that, well, if we're not ready to transition as an industry, uh, will it push back to 2021? And it didn't push back to 2021. But what we found is prices moved far enough that the industry adapted and enough fuel was made. And obviously, you know, we went to a global recession briefly because because of a, a pandemic and, and that helped calibrate things and, and bought time. But but as we look forward, there's a lot of uncertainty. So when we say it's, it's speculative right now. I don't know. It, it's speculative in, in a sense. I'd say where the most speculation is actually happening is when you move these offsets on a blockchain, which some companies have been doing, and then there's been a lot of speculation and arbitrage between what the kind of market looks like outside of blockchain and then what the market looks like once it enters that blockchain sphere, just because mm-hmm. uh, the definitions of, of kind of the, the units of blockchain versus the units of, of uh, carbon offsets outside of the blockchain and the quality difference, it all becomes one at that point. And, and it, at least that's the way it is today. And I think that's going to evolve as well. But I mean, you've seen these, the carbon offsets on the blockchain go from uh, the teens up to $300 and back uh, per ton, which is ridiculous uh, in terms mm-hmm. of, of a, a move uh, when, you know, the markets outside of that were, were moving, you know, in, in much smaller increments. <laughs> I think it shows you like that anything, anytime there's a financial instrument created, how willing people are to get gambling on it when they don't even really understand it from everything you've said so far. It's like a developing contract. Yeah, people are very aggressive in wanting to say the price should be here, the price should be here, and there's no real understanding of what it is yet. So yeah, it's just, just funny when you, when you see it like that. But when, yeah. you, when, you, when you mentioned the IMO, that was that's a really interesting point because I've got to say, leading up to IMO, one of the main things for me was why is everyone so certain that there's going to be adoption? I guess it's a cynical view of mine, but when you're trying to get the whole world to agree to something, when there's going to be such big price disparities between using the compliant fuel and not using the compliant fuel, I just thought part of the, say, a supply and demand picture wasn't being attributed to people just ignoring that. And uh, it doesn't look like that was the case. I mean, some of the countries that you would expect to not or feign interest genuinely were quite aggressive uh, in implementing the IMO. So I thought that was really, for me, very surprising. Do you see a similar thing with carbon? Like even, you know, the Chinas, the Indias, you've got very like growing emerging markets that they're still backing the idea of a proper voluntary carbon market. Do you you see any resistance there or frailness potentially in the market because of those types of countries? Yeah, well, I guess when I think about China and India, I I don't think as much personally about the voluntary carbon markets as I do the transition that has to happen there and the underlying technology and, and kind of emissions profile. And when it comes to that emissions profile, um, I am optimistic that we're going to be seeing more carbon capture say deployed in those countries, or we're going to be seeing uh, more alternative materials like plant-based materials produced uh, in, in those countries 
And as you see, the factories transition uh, to being greener uh, because they have greener power, let's say, uh, that's going to be helpful as well. So I'm optimistic from those perspectives. Um, when it comes to the carbon market itself, I, I, I don't, yeah, I, I tend to think outside of, of those specific countries and think more on a global perspective or uh, like a Western perspective in terms of where carbon markets are going to be, you know, gain the most traction, I guess, the most quickly. Um, or in, and I guess, you know, as we see in other markets, right, where in Singapore or, or, or Australia, like these sorts of places, we'll end up seeing uh, mm. markets evolving that that look like the markets we're familiar with, whether they're exchanges or whether they're voluntary in, in nature. And do you think there's enough momentum to withstand some of the shocks that I guess people are starting to expect now, you know, the Russia Ukraine situation moved from, you know, it was great for the oil companies in some ways because it moved them from being pariahs to suddenly the companies that can get us energy security and away from Russia. So it was that what's more important, you know, not to be beholden to Russia or don't produce carbon. Do, do you think that's a threat to the movement or do you think it's, it's come enough way and there's enough momentum to sustain those types of things? I think there's momentum. I mean, this, this mm -hmm. is, to me, the entire movement, if we want to call it that, is driven by consumer interest, where consumers yeah. want to be buying greener things, right? Where we're willing to pay a little bit more, let's say, to buy something that we think is better for ourselves or better for the planet, um, particularly if it's something that is just a better product, right? Like Tesla. People are willing to buy Teslas because they're awesome cars. They just happen to be electric vehicles and, and the cost has come down over time because of all of this enabled by by offsets. And, you know, I can speak to that in a minute. But mm -hmm. if the product's good, people are willing to buy it. And so corporations are seeing that and they're seeing that's a path to being more sustainable themselves and that that'll boost their own earnings. So they're, they want to be more sustainable and they mm -hmm. also want to be good actors as well. I and mean, you're seeing more and more of that. And then it's reciprocal where it's not just corporations wanting to do it for the consumer, but the corporations doing it uh, on behalf of the consumer, basically, where it's a BlackRock wants the companies that it's investing in to set sustainability goals and then be held accountable to those sustainability goals. So you have corporations holding corporations accountable. You have consumers holding corporations accountable. So I think that's where it all kind of drives from today. And that's different than what it's been in the past. And then you have the governments that are an overarching kind of tailwind to all of this as they start to to give grants and loans and put money into the space as we've seen happen in the u.s uh where it becomes a question is on the future of that regulation are they going to define a carbon price in the future that's global or regional are they going to create taxes instead of uh, relying on carbon markets to to be doing the offsetting so that that incentivizes further reductions in emissions um those things are unclear so like imo 2020 where it wasn't clear if they were going to push back because there was uncertainty over whether you were going to be able to meet the demand for the low sulfur fuels uh here it's a question of whether there are going to be rules put in place in any given period of time and if your offsets are going to be if the value of that offset is going to change because of that and where I'd, I'd liken the two also the imo 2020 to the carbon markets is the fundamentals were real in, in the IMO 2020 situation where you needed to hit certain prices for different commodities and the spreads had to be particular so that refiners would produce enough of the fuel so that consumers would buy one fuel instead of another fuel. All of that had to happen. And in the carbon markets, it's, it's similar where at certain price points, certain technologies exist. At other price points, those technologies can't survive today. So you need companies uh, willing to pay those prices. And you're seeing even, I mean, certainly with the technology companies like the Microsofts and Shopify's and Stripes of the world and, and, and all of these folks that, that folks are, are willing to pay for, um, for the offsets, uh, even in that context, right? So they're, they're helping enable the technology and that will help bring the cost down in the future. So they're being the good actors and they're not the ones with the worst for carbon footprints. So interesting. How you, yeah, that's a really, really good explanation there. But it, I know we don't want to labor the IMO point, but it was just when you say the price correction is so interesting because we were looking at the very low sulfur fuel oil price. And we're like, this is insane. This is like 
$25 per barrel more expensive than crude and like $35 per barrel more expensive than the current shipping fuel. And that's like a, at the time, that was like a, almost a 70% increase on the current prices. But it had to happen, like you say, in order to incentivize traders to to bring the fuel to market. And it was a big blending exercise and the, the companies, trade houses and majors did very well just buying low sulfur fuel and blending it. And, and it, I guess, as you say, it was probably actually what needs to happen to get things going. But given you're saying it's an end user led thing, that makes a lot of sense. Again, IMO, because in order for that price to be there, the shipping companies have to pass the cost over to the end users for, it, for them to be willing to still buy fuel at that price. Um, but I guess my concern is that's in the context of like a proper bull cycle. Uh, you know, you're an investor, you're talking about Stripe, Microsoft, uh, investing in green type companies has yielded fantastic returns. The PE ratios are really high. There's a lot of confidence waning in that type of thing, right? And I think if you're in green investments, does is there not a similarity to some of the Netflixy type, you know, blue sky thinking that tr people can't afford to have their money in these companies so much if there's a big recession, if uh, there's a flight of capital to more like yielding investments? Do you not see that as a potential threat if we have ridiculous inflation that continues and the recession follows, you see what I'm saying? And do you not see that as a threat? I mean, I see it as a threat on both sides. I mean, what we saw yeah. like during the recession, you know, the, um, I'll call it the recession, but during the um, the pandemic is a flight to things that were greener and things that were more sustainable for the, for the world. And that was a recession. I mean, it, it maybe not in the traditional sense of multiple quarters of negative growth, but I mean, that, that was a shock to the system uh, that happened very quickly. Um, we just had, you know, the entire conflict in, in Russia flare up and, and in the Ukraine recently. Similarly, we haven't seen it, abatement uh, in a major way from from sustainability. All markets pulled back and sustainable markets pulled back, uh, you know, in tandem with with the broader markets. So um, but, you, but you give you give the guys, you know, the, the let's just take UK. You know, the prices are rising pretty uncontrollably for food and, and petrol. And if there's been crises and this could get worse and worse and worse. Why would they even consider, um, why would they Why would they consider buying an electric car? And, and you've got to start thinking like that, right? The premium you're saying that people are willing to pay, it's all well and good now, but it's a potential threat. And then we had a lot of um, the Russia-Ukraine crisis that's taken a lot of oil staple going into going into Europe. So now the European companies and the US companies have to produce more oil domestically to sustain their own needs. And therefore there's going to be a switch to more energy security. Does that not, does that not put a pressure on the whole carbon exercise, but even the price as well, to some extent? Well, you know, I'll put it this way is I think carbon is part of the solution because it's a, it's effectively a free resource, right? It's just in the atmosphere today. It's coming out of plants, you know, industrial plants, every day, every minute of every day almost, right? So you have you have a lot of carbon that's being emitted into the atmosphere, already in the atmosphere. You can take that carbon and turn it into usable products. So you can take that carbon and turn it into jet fuel and diesel fuel. Uh, you can take it and turn it into chemicals. You can make it into things that get you off of oil. So to a certain extent, it's, it's a avoidance. It is an energy security uh, mm. solution, um, I mm. think, in the, in the medium to long term. Uh, the problem mm. today is, when you're producing that barrel of jet fuel or diesel fuel, it is more expensive than the alternative, but the higher prices go for diesel fuel and jet fuel, the closer those come to parity, right? So yeah. like, you know, like the IMO 2020, you know, kind of analogy, uh, you get to a point where people are switching, you know, because the price makes sense, not because of regulation. Like there was a point during the whole IMO 2020 story where high sulfur fuel was more expensive than low sulfur fuel. And it's all because of supply and demand, right? If you're not making any of the high sulfur fuel and you still need it for something, it's going to get more expensive. I mean, that's effectively what's what we're seeing today in, in the mm -hmm. petroleum markets uh, mm -hmm. and just markets generally is things are getting expensive because we need them and there's a shortage. Uh, the longer and the higher that shortage sustains, uh, the more likely you transition to greener products because they'll be cheaper, relatively speaking. So something mm -hmm. like this, a price shock to the upside coming from traditional fuels, I think is good for, uh, you know, the sustainability movement in that way. 
and it can in the long term produce i think uh energy security uh but in the in the short term everything's a mess right where everything's just expensive and and companies are just you know reacting to the current situation and trying to plan for what it's going to look like in in say that medium term but it's hard to plan yeah. when you have war happening when you have you know all this yeah. volatility in markets so and what we're seeing is continued interest today in companies transitioning um their carbon footprint and reducing their carbon footprint and by doing so they're becoming customers of companies that are going to produce be producing these sustainable fuels and they're you know when those fuels are produced in the next number of years they'll be the first customers because they signed up um and then as you look at you know other things further out from that like plant-based leather or um uh, recycled plastics like all of that is becoming more and more in vogue for companies to support and uh, and you're seeing that support happening so what that shock to the system would have to be from a recessionary standpoint for people to back off i'm not sure because you could just have you know more movement into that space as technology advances and as it becomes more and more likely that 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 outcome is going to be real and that's that's effectively what happened during the pandemic Actually, I do believe you as the, as you talk. Uh, I just, I guess the message is it's not a fad and you, you can forgive people for thinking to begin with, it did have that kind of feel to it. But as it keeps continuing, and as you have all these shocks and there's still, people are still going, there's still this commitment to get there from governments, from people, from the end users, most importantly, then, then that's, I mean, that's great to hear. I mean, so long as we're all willing to buy the products, which, you know, it's been proven, yeah, then the companies are going to seek to make them. Yeah. Uh, a really interesting thing you said earlier on as well was um, the, the easy money concept. Because I remember hearing Elon Musk say that about oil. He's like, yeah, it's easy money. You dig out from the ground, you sell it. There's an end user product. You know, it's, it's, it's making a lot of money. If carbon can be the same. That's fantastic. And we, we actually had a conversation on the podcast about hydrogen uh, before. And it was a similar thing then, a similar thing I'd say with carbon. When people come up with new contracts, there's always this concept of like, if it's a good, if it's a good thing, good product, if it's a good, if it makes sense, it will work. But again, more cynically, I believe that you need there to be just interests aligned the whole time. And um, I think that if this easy money concept, people adopt, adapt it, adopt all this, the end user is willing to pay, then what I think that creates, which is really powerful for a market, is a, is a non-zero sum game. So what I mean by that is in trading oil, people think, oh, I made money this year. That must mean someone else lost. It doesn't work like that. The producer is making this amount, you know, dug it up for X amount, sold it for more. That money is then effectively passed on to the trading community who then passes it on to the end user. So you're actually looking at the producer's money in, in an ideal world, the end user pays and the producer but then everyone kind of wins. And if you have everyone making money, which is possible in a non-zero sum game, as long as the end user pays the final price, yeah. then you have a lot of incentive to trade that market because actually you can have everyone win and it not be a, won't be an issue. The yeah. problem with carbon right now is, and I'm liking it to when I was asked to trade a contract years ago, is why don't you provide liquidity on the Canadian um, heavy sands oil, very niche specific thing. I said, well, that contract only exists so that Canadian... Uh, sands producers can hedge and that is literally it there's no real buyer well the, the buyer is the us but they, they don't really want to buy it they're not going to they're not going to trade that contract so you yeah. basically asked me to be the only buyer in the market and that's just not going to work so i look at carbon and i say why don't you trade carbon i'm like well there's only people who want to buy it so what do i need i need to sell and buy to people and formulate a strategy for it to really work and as soon as that can happen then we can get going and i think this leads us to the next point which is all the question which is how do we get to a standardization format and you have mentioned it earlier on yeah. about benchmarks different regions and, and get this kind of two-way flow is is there a need for more of this does it just need to expand and get more sophisticated or what's your I, I was about that? to say yes there, there there is and and what's complicated about the carbon markets is people think about say carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide is carbon dioxide right there's no difference mm -hmm. between one molecule of carbon dioxide and another molecule of carbon dioxide but what mm -hmm. is different is how you're avoiding that emission or how you're reducing that emission, right? So you end up with quality difference in the type of offset, 
even though they all represent a metric ton of, of carbon mm -hmm. dioxide or mm -hmm. carbon equivalent, right? Um, because you have differences in the way that that carbon is being reduced or whether that's captured and sequestered or whether it's just being avoided entirely. So I'll, I'll give you a few examples. One is if you're protecting a forest in uh, the U.S. even, if you're protecting a forest, and there's an article in Bloomberg about it today, actually, where there's question as to the quality of some offsets that uh, that are being created uh, in the in the government sphere, actually, where the, the government is is looking to uh, sell some offsets associated with some forests. And um, if you're not changing your behavior about how you're managing that forest or protecting that forest, and it's the same as what it was yesterday, tomorrow, then where is the added benefit? Where's the additionality to what you're doing? And why is that deserving of a carbon offset is kind of the question. Uh, it's the same question of if you protect this area of forest and then you cut down that area of forest right next door, then did you really achieve what you needed to achieve if you didn't protect, you know, the the entire forest? So so those are issues just from the natural offset side. But then you look at things like Tesla, where they're in a regulated market out in California and they can sell uh, LCFS, which are very similar to they are effectively a carbon offset. Um, they can sell these as they're producing vehicles because there's a mechanism for them as they're reducing the emissions associated with the transportation fleet, uh, they can sell a, a carbon offset. So they, the first quarter where they were profitable, they sold $500 million worth of offsets and were in the red, if I remember right, by about $470 million on their core business. So that technology, which I think we'd all agree is fantastic and the world's moving toward it and EVs are the future um, of, of you know personal ground transportation. Um, and the world is very much enabling that to be the future. And one company created that change, right? Mm, and it's yeah. going to be a better world because of Tesla and because we've, mm. we we're reducing emissions associated where you don't get that benefit today is for many other technologies. So if you're making an alternative material, let's say you're, you're making a plant-based material that can um, be used instead of plastic in some form or shirts, let's say it's half cotton, half polyester. Polyester is a plastic. If that polyester instead is made from a plant-based material that can survive wash cycles and that can last for the lifetime of that shirt in the same way that you know it lasts today using polyester, uh, why shouldn't you get a carbon offset when you sell that or produce that uh, when you get it for selling a Tesla, right? Mm -hmm. Those sorts of things is where I think we evolve to, where where I think you're deserving to have offsets associated with these avoidance uh, technologies. And then that will propel that technology to be adopted in the same way, let's say, that EVs are adopted now, where, where the whole world is pushing toward adopting these materials that are far less emittive than their alternative. And the folks that can help enable that are the petrochemical companies as well, where they can be investing in those technologies and, mm -hmm. and bringing them into their systems. Uh, but they'll want, they'll want to have a validator, a third party validation that what they're going to produce is going to be considered an offset and a considered value. And the games around that are going to be what makes things interesting. You have the same problems with oil. It's not like yeah. it's a... It's, yeah, yeah it, it's yeah, but I just so there's a whole validation industry that's yeah that's grown up now around the offset market and it's continuing to evolve. Where you have uh, the registries and then you have uh, folks that are actually validating quality of the registered offsets. So and then the, you know people are marketing those because they're deemed to be higher quality than other offsets that may be on the registry. And then you have mm -hmm. other companies now that are coming up that are their sole purpose is to, to validate and rank order quality. So you have all these different layers of, of types of companies that are coming up that are validating quality. Um, what I don't think you have yet is a pricing agency in the same way that, that we have pricing agencies that are posting prices daily in, in say the oil, gas, power markets. But, mm -hmm. um, but I, this I is it. you need to be able to gauge supply and demand as a trader, as some kind of gauge. And if you can't, it's not even about supply and demand of the general asset or commodity. It's supply and demand that will impact the contract you're trading. 
So that standardization, that pricing yeah. mechanism is so, so important to get yeah. right. And I guess we've got the framework. Part, yeah. yeah, the tricky part is you're going to have a contract that represents a natural offset, but not all natural offsets are created equal, right? So let's yeah. say that contract is $16 today. Uh, you could have you know, offsets that look like that offset, but are lower quality trading at a dollar. And you can have offsets that look like that offset, but are validated and people believe in them that are trading at, say, $30. So yeah. you can have this huge yeah. range that uh, that exists around that. And it's it's not dissimilar, say, to the oil market where you have, you know, three ba- major benchmarks, right? You have WTI, Brent, Dubai, yeah. and then you have markets that trade around that or are priced around those markets, plus or minus, and those spreads grow and shrink depending on, like you're saying, supply demand, whether that's financial or physical supply demand. And um, I think you're going to have the same thing in the in the offset markets. You just need to to get there, and um, and it's going to take years to evolve. It, it's uh, yeah. I was just going to say, it always amazes me at the power of the herd mentality, right? So I think it will be initially very hard to kind of cross that chasm, but once you do, and once you have the carbon price adopted and believed in, a bit like a currency, right? You just need to believe it that it exists. Then you can start incorporating it into the Brent price even, right? I mean, it, it, these kind of things will be, it's just it's just a standardization and trust. And uh, it's been done a lot of times before. And hopefully it, hopefully it's not too far away. I don't want to take any more of your time, Eric. Thanks so much for, for joining. That brings us to the end of the episode. Uh, again, thank you, Eric, for joining us. And thank you out there for listening. Don't forget, you can follow us on social media by searching Flux Liquidity Hub on Instagram and Flux Dash Live on LinkedIn. But for now, that's goodbye.